Welcome to the Music Retail Show. Fun, engaging, educational conversations for the musical instrument community. The Music Retail Show is brought to you by MIRC LLC, providing solutions for the musical instrument community by being a reliable source for diverse music products. If you need inventory for your music store, pawn shop, or e-commerce site, go to MIRCweb.com to find out more. All right, jumping into another episode. Man, this is the second day of Summer NAM. This has been a great time here. We've been connecting with a lot of people, a lot of great, great people, and that also means we're connecting with the great Jack Schwartz. <laughs> Jack's sitting right in front of me. He's with Schwartz & Welch Consulting, LLC. Obviously, Jack, I've known you to be affiliated with a lot of other brands in the past, but man, it's great to catch up with you and sit down and talk for a bit. It's always great seeing you guys, man. And, you know, MIRC has always been like a second home to me. Yes. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to get to go there and touch base with some of the guys. It's like coming home, but it's great to see you guys here. When I saw your smiling faces, I went, okay, this is going to be a good trip. So, uh, you know, thanks for inviting me to do this. Well, good, because usually when people see my face, I scare them. But, you know, that's so I'm glad it's a <laughs> That's <comforting>. my line. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so you've got a lot going on. One of the most recent things I know that you've been involved in with was, was with Fano Guitars. Um, so uh, why don't we dive in there? How, how's everything with that going, and how are you involved? Um, well, so... Let me give you a real quick history. Yeah. So I got involved with Fano after uh, I left Fender Guitars. Yeah. Um, I, I started doing some consulting, and uh, I was contacted by the previous owners of the company who also had two rock amplifiers and Tone King and uh, a few other things that they had. And Fano Guitars, uh, they were having some inconsistencies in manufacturing process. So uh, they hired me as a consultant, and within a month, uh, the owner said, hey, I want you to come work for me, you know, run manufacturing operations and everything. And they were located in Central California. Okay. I'm in Arizona. And I said, I'll help you out, but no, I don't want to come to work for you. So right before Winter Nam, I get a call very late night, early morning. I'll tell you what, we'll move the company to Arizona. You hire all your own people, do whatever you want, just take over the company. So... I went, Everybody know, gets that phone call in the middle of the yeah, night, right? Yeah, so you know? it was a great challenge, and uh, and so I started uh, working for them. That was in uh, 2015. Okay. Uh, in 2016, they decided to sell the company, and uh, myself and the current owner, we, uh, we went into it together. And in 2017, I decided to sell my portion off because um, it would have been a conflict of interest. I was starting to get other interest in other consulting jobs. Okay. And I, I didn't feel while I was still an owner that I could also do consulting. Yeah. So um, the current owner is also the master builder okay. uh, of Fano Guitars. He's an amazing builder. What's his, his name, name again? His name Graham Dowling. Graham, okay, yes. And, uh, I've and, seen his Instagram yeah, uh, and, uh, channel. And he builds phenomenal guitars. We've been able to build up you know, the reputation. One of the things we're proudest about is in the four and a half, five years that we've been building guitars, our quality is like without reproach. Mm -hmm. We haven't had any returns. People will email us saying, oh my God, I had high expectations, but this is even better than what I expected. Yeah. Um, we've got a very loyal, you know, dealer base. I have to mention, uh, guitars to be played here Come in on, Nashville. Josh. Josh. We should have uh, had him sitting right here yeah, in the chair. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. He's, he's been amazing, um, and he's been a, a great advocate for our guitars. And I think the other thing that's been really satisfying for me is seeing the number of artists that are playing guitar. We don't have a formal artist endorsement program like you know most major companies mm -hmm. work directly with artists. We have artists, uh, in fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine. They said, hey, I was watching Late Night with James Corden, and the bass player on there is playing one of your Fano basses. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I know. So you work with her? I've never met her, never talked to her. She's actually an endorsee for somebody else that I understand. Mm -hmm. But every night I turn it on TV, and there she is playing our bass. Yeah. And that is the most truest sense of endorsement. And, you know, so we're really proud of what we're doing. We've... Uh, 
we're still, do, you know, a lot of companies are struggling right now with delivery, and we're yeah. still able to provide guitars. Now we're heavily back ordered. Sure. Um, but every guitar is hand built, every guitar is unique. So, you know, when a dealer gets one of those guitars, there's no competition somewhere else where they go, oh, well, I'm going to go price shop it with someone else. They can't because it's a one of a kind piece. Yeah. And strictly, you know, hand built uh, by one of our master builders. We don't do a production line other than, you know, the the initial, initial woodworking and paint, of course. Yes. You know, we use modern technology, CNC's. But uh, other than that, guitar is built by one guy from start to finish. And we're very, very proud of that, you know. How many guitars are uh, come out of there in a month? Um, we do anywhere between 40 to 55 guitars a month. Okay. Man, that's impressive coming from one person. Yeah, well, we've got two builders. Oh, two builders. I'm we've sorry. We've got two okay. builders. Okay. And, uh, and ha with my background in manufacturing, mm -hmm. that's one of my areas of expertise, Yeah. we're able to come up with things to make sure when we do it first time, it's correct the first time. So yes. we go back, we do a lot of root cause analysis. We work closely with our wood shop to make sure fret installation is perfect. So when the guys get the guitar, they have to do fret dressing, it's more like fret polishing. Sure. Because the frets are all seated properly. They're all level and crowned and, and you know, so we don't run into a lot of the problems that a lot of other companies do. And it's part of manufacturing. It's not a bad thing. I'm not say it's just a different way, it's mm -hmm. a different approach. But as a small company, I'm able to, uh, you know, maximize our output and maximize uh, not having to do a lot of rework or a lot of, you know. And yeah. these guys are both, you know, trained luthiers. So if they had to go out into the shop literally and carve a neck or cut a body, they could do that. Yeah. So they know the int intricacies and, you know, all the different physics of, of the guitar. So, it, it, you know, it gives them an edge over, you know, um, in a lot of production, you have expertise. It's kind of like specialization, you know, with doctors. You got your ear, no, nose, and throat, and you got your yes. gastrointestinal, and you know, on and on. All these specialists. Well, in the guitar industry, you got somebody that does all the fret work. You got another person that does all the wiring. Another person that does setup. Another one that does quality. Our guys are well versed in every aspect Everything. of it. So, yeah. You know, it gives us uh, a little bit of advantage from a small company and we don't want to be a big company. Fano yeah. does not want to be a big company. We want to maintain high-end boutique guitars. Yeah, because you would always be afraid if you became this huge company, would you lose a little bit of that magic touch that makes you who you are? Absolutely. You know, I think there's a, a magic formula and I think there are other manufacturers um, that have found the same thing that, you know, they found, hey, here's where the happy medium is of really being a custom boutique and where we have to expand into like more mass production. Mm -hmm. And I wanna, you know, I did the mass production thing for over 35 years. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to get in something a little more personal, you know, um, more like, you know, the Fender Custom Shop. I think that's what makes them so special, you know. I mean, they're world renowned because they've got master builders that, you know, do these unique personalized things and you know it's why they also cost a lot of money yeah. you know and I think finding that niche you know I I just find it to be much more satisfying and, and able to use the things that I've learned in my you know in my time in this business yeah very cool man I, I mean I, th I think it's a great company um, actually I mean, you guys came into MIRC at one of our open houses, what, three, three years, years ago? ago That's how yeah. you met Josh, yeah. Guitars to be Played. And I, I thought the guitars were great. Oh, thank uh, you. Great. That was my first introduction uh, uh, to, uh, to Fano. But, um, man, it just seems like it's uh, sky's the limit from here. So It really is. I, I think like everybody else in the industry right now, and I'm sure other people have mentioned too, demand is super high and mm -hmm. supply is very tough right now. Yeah. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about parts and materials and everybody's scrambling for the same. So um, that's always a challenge. But I think the fact that there's such a demand and that I think COVID really helped the music industry and that people rediscovered playing instruments and, you know, kept them from going stir crazy. I know yeah. that I spent a lot of time in my recording studio recording and writing music and I, 
I've got a lot of guitars. I actually got an opportunity to play a lot. Hey, of them. that's you know, nice. I, I did some more guitar work, you know, doing some fret work here and there. Going, oh, this guitar of mine, I need to do a fret level crown and dress. And before I would have went, oh, I'll just go play that other guitar. I don't mm -hmm. have time, but I had time. Yes. And so I think a lot of people are discovering that and discovering the nuances of different guitars. And so for guitars like ours, like Fano guitars, uh, we've really been able to garner a really nice following uh, of people that have fallen in love with, with what we do. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, Jack, you, you, you have a lot of things going on in your life. <laughs> uh, not just Fano, Fano is a huge love that uh, you've involved in. What else do you guys have going on? You have a consultant company and maybe you're right. uh, touching other aspects of the music industry. Yeah, so one of the things and I have to give credit to my time in Fender. For the last 10 or 15 years that I was at Fender, um, I was in charge of all the offshore manufacturing quality. And so I would visit every factory, including uh, Fender's own factories, but also all of their inspection groups, all their returns groups. So it was kind of full cycle. And I was uh, in charge of their customer service department. So had this full loop, so we were getting feedback from customers and dealers that I would then feed back to the manufacturing, and I would actually go to the to the manufacturing factories and the plants, work with the people there to improve their processes, you know, whether it be fret installation or how they were cutting and routing out the pickup channels or, you know, a truss rod channel. So um, after I got out of Fender, I started utilizing some of my manufacturing knowledge for other yeah. companies that were struggling where they're going, hey, we just got, you know, 5,000 guitars and 6% of them, you know, there's problems with them. And how, how do I communicate? How do I work? Or there's companies that say, I want to design a new guitar and I need to find the right sourcing, the right factory. So one of the things I used to do um, is I used to do basically it's called a SWOT analysis. Are you familiar with that term? I am not. So SWOT is S-W-O-T. And what it means is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, yeah. and threats. Mm -hmm. So I would do these uh, profiles of the factory okay. and a SWOT analysis, and I would know, oh, this company's strength is like if you had, say, a company that wanted to do a guitar that had a lot of graphics and inlays. I would know which factories to go to. Gotcha. I could I see. coordinate I see. the pricing, the samples, the minimum order quantities, uh, what type of pickups, what type of hardware, all those type, and help them put that together. Same thing for acoustic guitars, which I've done for several clients, as well as helping them with design. And because my background, I've also done a lot of sales and marketing. I help mm -hmm. um, occasionally with music stores, training sales staff or repair staff. Um, you know, let me. Is there? I heard this rumor that you hold the world record for changing strings on a guitar or something. No, in a that's record not amount true. Of time. That's not true. <laughs> um, I used to do what was called the bench check clinic, yeah. and I actually never changed the strings on them. I would have two or three, sometimes four guys, changing the strings. Yeah. And then I would do a full setup and diagnostic on the guitar. Okay. It took four guys to string the guitars while I would do a full setup. I can do a full setup intonation everything on a telecaster in two and a half minutes unbelievable and in fact the technique so a little history um when i first grew up and started getting into guitar building and guitar setup when i was a touring musician i'd stop in music stores and go i can set up all your inventory for you because it needs it that mm -hmm. neck needs a truss rod adjustment those frets are sharp that pickup's set incorrectly your intonation's out and it'll help you sell them they go yeah what are you going to charge us and i go i don't want cash I need to get some more gear. I'll charge you uh, $10 a guitar, and however many guitars I do, I'll trade that out in gear. Now, I had a list of all the other touring bands that I worked with yeah. of what they wanted, and I go, oh, I need that wah-wah pedal, oh, I need that amp, oh, I want to get that guitar. Um, and of course, they thought, well, how long are you in town? I'm in town a week. Well, two days later, I'd have all their inventory done. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you do yeah. that? And I said, well, I developed my own techniques. When I worked, at, when I first started at Fender, which was CBS Fender in 1981, okay. I became a tuner tester, uh, which is the guy at the end of the line that does the setup work. And they had a quota of 35 guitars per person. And I went, really? 35? Go, yeah, I know most of the people can't make 35, but that's, that's the ceiling that we're trying to get everybody to. And I went, okay, well, by 11 o'clock in the morning, I had my 35 done <laughs> and I had my 
little Walkman yeah. in. I'm learning songs for the yeah. gig that night. Do I night. get to go home now? So <laughs> finally, when Fender yeah. got sold and transitioned to the new ownership in 1985, um, I left for a short period, and then they, I was playing music for a living in Alaska. Okay. They called me up and said, we're starting production in Corona. We want you to take over the final department and teach them your methodology. So I started teaching uh, everybody how I set up guitars, how I... and. I took over the entire fun. So once the guitar was buffed and polished and ready to be assembled, I took over sub-assembly, uh, all assembly, final tuner testing, repair, and all that. So a lot of the master builders that ended up uh, in a custom shop started off working for me. Really? In the early days, That's guys like Fred Stewart. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, um, so what ended up happening is after a while they said, "We need you to go out and like we want to teach." people out there how to do it. So I started doing seminars for like uh, Duquesne University or okay. uh, Berkeley School of Music, Stanford. And I'd do seminars teaching guitar setup and stuff. And then I would go and set up uh, all of the different um, service centers. So we were starting a new server center, service center program. So I'd go out there, qualify them, and teach them techniques. And what's funny now uh, is that a lot of the people that I've worked with now work for other companies. In fact, I ran into a guy who's a product specialist for Gibson. He goes, that stuff that you taught me back when I worked at Guitar Center, yeah. I still use that. I go to my dealer store and I go through his wall and I set up all my Gibsons using your technique. So it's it's flattering. It, you know, it's part of the industry. Everybody comes up with a lot of ideas that they do. Yeah. But, you know, basically if you see a guy using a capo with a feeler gauge and a six inch ruler and a tape measure to measure intonation, things like that, those are all techniques I introduced to the industry. Okay. So um, that was kind of my claim to fame. Yeah. And my record, uh, which I did um, for Sam Ash Music, I, to, to mention, you know, one of the big guys, um, Sammy Ash asked me to do a clinic. It, I think, can't remember where the store was. I want to say Long Island, but I don't remember where. Okay. And we kind of did a, a 10 hour thing, and I did 187 guitars. Did you? In one day. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, man. 187? And that's full intonation. Could you everything. see straight by the end of the day? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could do that in my sleep. Yeah. At, at my age, and I'm almost 70, yeah. I can still do a Telecaster in two and a half minutes. You really? Full intonation, full on setup, everything. Uh, and that's what I teach. It's, you know, uh, I've actually been on the uh, board of advisors of a luthiery school in Phoenix called Roberto Venn School of Luthiery. Okay, absolutely. And uh, I would go there and teach students, and a lot of the students there that are now out, you know, um, I still keep in touch with. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, basically, I want to pay that forward because I don't want to take all that information with me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so. so this is the expertise that you're bringing into your consultant business. That is correct. Which is why, uh, obviously, why Fano wanted to bring you on, and some of these other companies are asking you to kind exactly. of jump in and help. And sometimes it's short term, just, you know, hey, we have this one problem or these two problems. Can you help us out? And it can be in sales and sales and marketing, um, or, you know, everything like um, to mention another one of the big chains, Guitar Center. I did 73 grand openings for them. Did you really? And I would go in a week early and train all their new staff on how to maintain, how to set up the walls, how to segregate the product, you know, to optimize the mm -hmm. sales process. Um, if you walk into any of the guitar centers that have like a guitar and amp that are kind of mounted into the wall, like it's been in there. Yeah. Uh, myself and a, a gentleman named uh, Scott Liebau, who was uh, part of their crew that did that. We did all, we cut the amps, we cut the guitars in half and mounted them on the walls and all that. And I would do uh, training with all those guys and their staff. And then I would come back maybe uh, six months later, do a recap, certify a couple of repair guys. And uh, yeah, so I would teach how to display, how to sell, selling techniques, how to quantify and qualify customers. Yeah. Every aspect of that, which is when I talk to like say Fano dealers now, They'll call me and they say, so Jack, I got a question for you. I got customers that, you know, like this. How would you go about this? And I'll give them, you know, consultation on how to how to display or how to market or how to write something for an online thing or, you know, what woods are complementary to different pickups, you know, um, what the different sounds, you know, like yeah. you don't want to put these pickups with like, uh, you know, Swamp ash with a maple top is going to be really bright. Don't put bright pickups on there, yeah. you know. 
you want to have some pickups that have some low end response to kind of balance it out. So just different things like that. And it's stuff I love doing anyway. And if I can help a company out, um, you know, I get hired as a consultant. Yeah. yeah. So last year probably brought a lot of challenges, you know, uh, all the way into this year with supply chain issues, yep. you know, people just even being able to get materials to maybe even build guitars. Um, Fano's running into that itself. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how are you guys dealing with that? Well, one of the things that's very nice is over my almost 50 years in this industry, I've made a lot of really close friends and colleagues and um, they call in favors and I call in favors. So, and, and I won't mention the brand or anything, but uh, one of the guys that I hired years ago in a position uh, now runs uh, a position getting a certain kind of hardware. Hmm. And they've been back ordered from everybody, but every month or so he'll slip me five or six of this particular hardware and go, Jack, you took care of me, I'm gonna take care of you, even huh. though the backlog. So. I get enough to keep us going. Um, a lot of guys, uh, to give you an example, when I work with the offshore manufacturers, they usually have an MOQ or a minimum order quantity that they require. I can contact them and they'll go, how many do you need? And, <laughs> and, and there's always, I mean, look, it's gotta be within reason. They're not gonna do five guitars on a production line, but I don't also don't need to order a thousand yeah. or 500. Mm -hmm. I can order, I want 10 of these and five of these and whatever, and they'll build them for me. and. Basically, you know, I help them out and they help me out. Yeah, absolutely. You know? This is an industry where you don't burn any bridges. No, huh? never. And, you know, look, every company, I, I will be the first to tell you in my 35 years of Fender, they gave me so much opportunity to learn, to test things out, to meet people. I've traveled the world for Fender, everywhere from Australia, Germany, UK, Finland, you know, South America, all of Asia, you know. Um, how many people can say that they got paid to go do that? No, it was a lot of work and a lot of time away from home. But um, it's one of those things you build relationships, and you know, I still am on Zoom calls and phone calls all yeah. over the globe, or something as simple as just you know text messages or video conference calls. You know, and during COVID, it it kept me from going stir crazy. You yeah. know, I'd have people call me, hey, let's get on. You know, I'm on a Zoom call with someone in Taiwan. You yeah. Know? And we're talking about the challenges to them, talking about their families, my family, and and from an industry standpoint, where I can help them and where they can help me, and they yeah. give me information of what's going on. You mm -hmm. know, you know. But but what amazes me is is out of all this stuff you do, you still have time to play in two different bands and record your own material. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I when I first got hired by Fender in 1981, yeah. I I did that with a caveat, and I said I want you to know. First and foremost, I'm a guitar player, singer, songwriter, and playing music and playing live and recording are my primary. I said, everything else, building guitars, working on guitars, is secondary to that yeah. and helps support that. You know, now, as a musician, I want a great guitar. I want a great amp. Uh, you know, I want a great sound system. So I learned about all that, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's how I got into it. I mean, to, to begin with, when I was 15 years old and I started really playing professionally, I was making enough money to buy gear, but not to like have a fret job or sure. to buy a bunch of strings or to buy an effects pedal or whatever. So I started working on guitars, you know, and learned how to wind pickups. And I mean, all those different types of things. I did it as part of the necessity of being yeah. a guitar player. I thought everybody did that. I thought everybody learned how to adjust a truss rod. and. I used to tinker in cars, so, you know, like I had an old 65 Mustang that I did everything, you know, I used to change the header, you know, or, you know, do the tune-ups and um, adjust the timing and all that. You yeah. could do that without all the computer stuff. I just applied, that's where I got out of yeah. feeler gauge yeah. to check a truss rod. I went, the, the tone tap method and my eyes couldn't see the difference in two thousandths of an inch. So I just started and Fender allowed me to take like a thousand guitars and try the methodology every day and it proved out and I went okay this works and then I could teach other people that so it they've all go hand in hand with each other yeah you know playing guitar gives me a chance to oh wow this guitar sounds like this and it 
you know, same thing. I when I'm doing production or engineering for somebody else, they go, oh, I want to get this kind of sound. I used to do session stuff in Hollywood in the early days. They'd call me up, oh, I need a country sounding lick that sounds like, you know, Chet Atkins or, mm -hmm. you know, Carl Perkins or whoever the, the guitar player, you know, James Burton. Oh, okay, well, I need a telly. I need a 59 basement or a twin reverb. I need this reverb and, you know, and so I'd go in. I didn't read music, but that's how I fell in love with that part yeah. of it. I can't see a life without that. I, the first thing, as soon as the COVID thing started lifting, I started going out and gigging again. Yeah. You know? uh, I told my wife, she goes, are you ever going to relax? I said, yeah, when I'm six foot under, <laughs> you know, that'll be time for rest. I need to play music. Yeah. So it's, I call it my addiction, you know, playing guitar, singing, writing. It's part. It's like breathing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know that. I, no, no, know. no. We we all love it. Ian's a great guitar player over here, and it's like, you know, you go through periods of time where you don't pick it up, and then you've always got to go back, and then you find yourself going, "Man, why don't I do this more?" You know, and you just want to. But uh, what was the, what was the, what, what what guitar do you play right now? So, when uh, I first started back when Fender transitioned uh, in 1985. And in early 1986, we started the Corona Factory and introduced the very first American Standard Stratocaster. And since I was involved in all the production stuff, I went and picked out a two-piece ash, swamp ash body. Uh, the painter that came over from CBS, I told him, I said, okay, I want you to take the candy. So candy apple red was mm -hmm. a two-step process where you painted a solid gold metallic mm -hmm. base coat and then it did a translucent, um, like cherry color yeah. over the top. And I said, I don't want you to put the gold down. I just want you to do the translucent, but in a burst. So it's darker on the edges and lighter in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with a guy named Don Lace to design the, uh, the sonic part of uh, the Lace sensor pickups that oh, he okay. designed. So he would come to me and he'd have all these different things and he'd have clips and he'd go, oh, what this, no, nah, I need a little bit more Oh, I need a little more 5K. Uh, I need a little bit more down in the hundred. Um, and we voice, and I go, okay, now that's that blue, that sensor blue. Now it sounds more like a PAF. That's what we want to go. So I helped them design um, the sonic aspects of it. Fender put out the Fender Lay sensors. The very first ones that came off production are in my guitar. Really? And I also designed the circuitry. Uh, because the it looks like a humbucker, but it's actually two single pickups that are called the red, which are like a, each individual is like a humbucker, and it has a three-way toggle, so you can use the inside pickup, the outside pickup, or the combination of the two. Really? And okay. then in the five-way switch, in the middle position, you get all your tele positions. Um, I also hand-built the neck myself and had... Some of the very first, a guy named Jim DeCola, who now works for Gibson, uh, came up with some of the very first stainless steel frets. And when I heard he did that, uh, Jim and I worked together um, here in Nashville, um, and I had Jim put in stainless steel frets. Uh, so every piece of that guitar, uh, I have what's called the L. I worked with the guy that designed LSR uh, bridge and the, the nut and they had a tuner that was a 50 to 1 ratio it looks like space tuners really they put them on some of the jackson guitars i have that on my guitar so that's my number one guitar um i've got about 30 or 40 others and a bunch of bass <laughs> but yeah. every one of them has yeah. significance so for example um in 1986 fender decided to try their hand at doing some bowling ball guitars uh, this bowling, bowling ball, ball finish. Guitars? Bowling okay. ball finish. Oh, okay. I see what you're uh, saying. Yeah. Ibanez does a lot of that. Okay, yeah. And I Fender have. tried it. They built about 20 guitars. And I built, I actually assembled them, put them together, the prototypes and everything. And I told the plant manager at the time, I said, I'm taking this one and I'm going to build this one as a Strat Plus, which had the lace sensors yeah. and everything. Um, and then I gave it to my brother a few years afterwards. I said, look, I don't play this thing. You know, you keep it. He recently retired, moved to Monterey, and he goes, hey, want to give you your guitar back. It's been, you know, 25 years or more. Wow, I forgot all about this. So I brought it home, fixed it up, and I was looking on Reverb, and those are so rare, they're worth anywhere from twelve to $18,000 now. Unbelievable. And I'm going, and I built this one, and I built the other ones that are out there. So, so now it's worth 28. Story. <laughs> yeah. But, so, but... 
Yeah. Look, I'm a strap player. I yeah. will always be a strap okay. player. Uh, I play lots of others. I've got two or three Fanos that I love. I designed my own, uh, what they call is a PX6, and I put a Floyd on it with stainless steel frets and a very small flat radius. And, you know, look, that's the beauty of working in custom guitars and everything, you know. So that's probably my one of my workhorse guitars. I use that a lot in the studio. But when I go out and play, my comfort factor is always going back to that Strat. Back to that Strat. I know, it's always kind of funny how, you know, um, there's a lot of great guitars and a lot of great builders out there. Yep. Don't get me wrong, but it's just kind of funny how guitars, though, get split into like a like a Strat or a Les Paul sound. You know, maybe it's just because those are just two famous shapes, but people kind of associate sounds with those shapes of guitars. I think it goes one step further, and I think um, the marketing department at Fender actually got this at one time. Um, and I've taught about this, like when I did my seminar at Duquesne University, start getting into sound, and I said, you know, the uniqueness about Les Pauls, 335s, Strats, and Tellies, is that not only were those used on iconic songs, but there were songs written for that instrument. Huh. So you can't play that song. You can't play a Ricky Nelson or Elvis song that James Burton played on without playing a Telecaster like a James Burton through an amp that, you know, it's the reason that, that Jimmy Page on the very first Led Zeppelin album played a Telecaster through a twin. He wanted to get that certain sound. He was a very experienced studio cat. He goes, if I want that sound, here's how I'm gonna get it. And so those shapes and models and designs become iconic. People grew up with them. So yeah. maybe their first guitar was a Squire or whatever. They grew up with that. It's it's why the thing that I love about Fano is it's based on a lot of the iconic principles. Yes. So we take, you know, something from a Rickenbacker, something from a Gibson. We don't copy it, but we use the influence. And then we meld them with some modern technology, compound radiuses, stainless steel frets, things like that, upgraded pickups, hardware, things like that. Um, and it makes its own unique thing. But a lot of that has to do with the sonic capabilities and how they play and how they feel. I love it when a guitar player picks up a guitar and goes, wow, this is like that old sweatshirt that I've been wearing for mm -hmm. 20 years that my wife wants me to get rid of, and it stinks and it's got holes in it, but God, when I wear it, I just, I feel comfortable it, and yeah. I'm right, you know, and that's how guitars are as well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you can pick up, and it's funny how different people like different guitars. You know, you absolutely. can sit there and you go, Oh my God, this this is the best feeling guitar I've ever played. And somebody can pick it up and go, eh, you know, and they pick something else that it just, you're right. It's like uh, every guitar has its own owner. Well, I, I still remember, um, you know, Eric Clapton is one of the largest signature guys for Fender. Mm -hmm. And he had his own signature Strat. And he decided he's going to do a blues tour. And so he got a bunch of Fender amps as well as a couple Dumbles and but he decided for most of the tour, he's gonna to play his 335 because that's the sound and, and that's where his comfort zone. He went back into some of his cream mode, you know, I want that kind of sound and feel. Yeah. And like for me, you know, if I want a certain sound, a certain feel, I know I have to go to, and it's something I've taught a lot of the young guys that I go in, they go, hey, can you, you know, can you help me record something? I got to get this sound. I go, well, you're not going to get it with that yeah, and all those no, pedals. Here's right. how you go and get that sound. Really? And I go, yeah, here, watch. Your style and your playing and application will change. And I'll pull out one of my guitars, plug it into an amp, dial it up and go, start playing. And they'll go, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I sound different. Now, mm -hmm. that player's feel and touch and chops or everything, you know, um, Eddie Van Halen was, you know, known for plugging into... Ted Nugent's twin reverbs and still sounding like Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. But to get the sonic qualities and the response and everything, that's where, you know, understanding what makes those guitars so iconic all comes down to, you know. You lose the DNA of that and you lose a lot of what makes those guitars, yeah. you that, know. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. I could sit and talk about guitars all day long, but uh but I man, do. yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 you do, and uh, man, and you do it. You do a great job of it too. You oh, really do. You. So you're always 
You're always fun. I don't even say you're fun to talk to. It's like you're fun to listen to, <laughs> you know, because the, you know, the stories that you tell, you've been around it, you've experienced, you've seen it. And, and it's, it's wonderful to absorb that. Oh, well, thank so, you. but, uh, I man, I want it. you to tell, I want you to tell the story to close us out. I want you to tell the story of one time you were down in Florida at uh, Thoroughbred's Music Festival oh, and uh, you found yourself in a fun situation. You got to tell this story. So, um, Fender sent me down to uh, Thoroughbred Music used to have these yearly um, music expos. Yeah. And they would bring in, every year they'd bring in different, you know, stars. And, uh, and then usually on a Friday night or a Saturday night, they'd have a big stage and they'd open it up to everyday public and they'd have a big concert. And they would have individual players play and maybe do a small clinic and, you know, demo with a backing band. And then they'd have like an all-star jam. Well, one year, um, Andy Timmons, who was a, a friend of mine, um, said, hey, Jack, we're going to do this all-star jam. And it was, and I'm not going to name all the guys, but a couple of hot shot guitar players yeah. who were fast technique. And, you know, a bass player like Billy Sheehan or Steve Bailey and drummer like a Rod Morgenstein or, you know, Greg Bissonette. Um, and Andy said, look, all you got to do is sing. And I went, awesome, what are you going to do? I got to know the songs. He goes, oh, just standards. We'll do like, you know, we'll do Tush by ZZ Top. And we'll do Rock and Roll or maybe, you know, the Immigrant song. And we'll, we'll just embellish and we'll just do a bunch of covers. I went, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're playing and towards the end of the night, um, Andy comes up to me and he says, hey, want to do a song to kind of feature everybody let everybody do a solo let's do uh do you know little wing by and i said ah oh, that's one of my signature when i play guitar in a cover band that's one of my signature songs you know i love that song he goes okay then you kick it off and then introduce everybody and they'll all do their solos so yeah started off hey ladies and gentlemen this is you know frank gambali on guitar over here or this is billy sheehan on bass over here and uh you know and then Billy and Greg Bissonette do a kind of a yeah. combo thing. And then I go, and ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend and one of my favorite all time, my guitar hero, Mr. Andy Timmons. Just one of the greatest, you mm -hmm. know. And so Andy plays and now I'm going, oh man, you know, good thing I don't have to play. You know? <laughs> and I'm just playing chords and I'm getting ready to go. He, Andy finishes and I get ready to go into the last verse and kind of wind the thing down. Andy comes over, puts his arm around me. Billy kind of comes close and they go, Mr. Jack Schwartz of Fender Guitars, show him what you got, Jack. And of course, <laughs> my initial thing was to pee my pants, but instead, yeah. um, you know, I just did my meat and potatoes, yeah. you know, my best version of me. Yeah. Crowd loved it. The guys all came over afterwards, and you know, and I realized these are just guys that guys. played a different they, life, but they're right. guys. Yeah. They're just like you and me, and. Uh, they you want know. to hang out, they want to have yeah. a good time, and, and they want to include people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it would be very humbling, and instead it really made me feel really, spe they made me feel really good and yes. like I was an equal, and uh, I'll always be grateful. And, and it's really funny, uh, another friend of mine, uh, Greg Koch, I don't know if you know who Greg is, uh, uh, amazing guitar player, if you've never, he's out of uh, the Milwaukee area. If you ever get a chance, go listen to the guy is okay. a monster player. He was doing some um, online interviews, he, like he was interviewing Steve Lukather, and he was interviewing Andy. And in the middle of their interview, Greg goes, well, I think we got a mutual friend. So all of a sudden, those guys are talking about me, which was like, <laughs> I had people texting me, Greg and Andy, you're talking about you, yeah. dude. I'm going, oh. But, you know, it, it just goes to show you that this industry, I mean, I've been lucky enough to meet sure. almost all of my idols. And the cool thing is they're guitar geeks just like you and me. Mm -hmm. And we talk just like, I, I, I want to close with one other short story. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. I was in, um, in Brighton, the UK. And a buddy of mine who writes for Guitar Magazine over there said, hey, I got tickets to go see Jeff Beck tonight. And uh, there's a guy out of New Orleans called Trombone Shorty opening up, but Greg's play I mean, uh, Jeff's playing. And uh, afterwards, I'm supposed to get an interview with Jeff. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah, you got to come along. Man, you got to meet Jeff. And I said, well, I actually met him years ago, but I'd love to go see Jeff, you know. So... Um, 
after the show, and Jeff is amazing. We go backstage oh, and we're waiting, and he comes out, and there's this older guy sitting off, you know, just looks like, you know, your washer dryer repair guy, you know, dressed mm -hmm. very casually, you know, not a guy you would think would be hanging out with the rock stars. Jeff comes out, sees the guy, hugs him and goes, oh my God, I don't know whether to hug and kiss you or to punch you. <laughs> and I looked over at Jeff and and my friend Jamie introduced himself, I'm from Qatar, and Jeff looks at me and he goes, we've met before. And I said, oh yeah, another story. And he goes, well, this guy over here, he says, I've known him since I was a wee lad. And I said, really? And he said, I'll tell you my story. And this is why I wanted to end with this. He goes, do you know what an HO train set is? And I said, oh yeah, my dad and I, we took, you know, an uh, eight by four piece of plywood and built mountains and yeah, did a train and sure. the HO. Mm -hmm. He goes, exactly. He said, well, my dad and I, he said, we built this wonderful thing. And this bloke here talked me into trading it for a set of drums. Can you imagine me playing drums? <laughs> he goes, and I never got that train set, that HO set back. He says, now, of course, Rod, he says, I don't know if you know, Rod is this big aficionado on those things, has mile-long, you know, train sets and HO cars and everything. And I went, wow. And he goes, but if it weren't for this guy, I wouldn't have gotten into music. And then I discovered the guitar from the drums. And I've made my living playing guitar because of that. And that's why I don't know whether I should punch him or kiss him. <laughs> and I just went, oh, my God. But the fact that he, yeah. here's Jeff Beck, one of my influences and idols yeah. telling me that personal story was something i just went you can't find this in any other industry no, this is amazing and the fact that i got to have this moment sitting with jeff um made my career you know uh you, you go back and go i've, been, I've lived a blessed life you yeah. know i thank fender i thank all the other companies i work for you guys at MIRC, you guys are like family, and it, it makes it awesome. Yeah, it, you know, it's funny. My one story about Jeff Beck is he played at the Ryman, which is yeah, just right yeah. over here. I don't know, probably about uh, 10 years ago. He's played since then, but about 10 years ago, and a bunch of us went to went there, and then when we got in there before the show started, you saw, you saw oh, hey, yeah, you knew that person and that person. Oh, wow, look who's over there, and look who's over there. And, yeah. the, and it was funny that they said that if the roof fell in on the Ryman that night, there'd be no guitar players left in Nashville yep. because they were all there to see Jeff Beck play. So, uh, but uh, I'm telling you, man, he's, he's an incredible, incredible guitar player, and I'm glad he's one of your influences because... Oh. Uh, he's, he's spectacular. So absolutely. But uh, man, Jack, you're a wonderful person, wonderful uh, human being. Thank you so man. much. So are you guys, man? And always a pleasure yes. seeing you guys. Like I said, my face lit up when I saw you guys sitting Yay. off in the corner here. I went, "Oh, <laughs> there's Nate and Ian. Awesome." Yeah. So just okay. Wonderful to see you guys. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on here and tell stories. And yeah share my passions with well, you guys man, man i'd love to you know uh later on we want to just keep the conversation going if we can catch up with what you're doing later on and Absolutely. see how fano's doing and everything so uh I'd it'd be that. the best thanks man i really appreciate it Nate. you bet thanks for listening to the music retail show 